Well, many are calling what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border a deliberate invasion of the United States, a well-orchestrated invasion that's even being funded by the United States government. Everyday buses by the hundreds are coming through the Darien Gap in the Darien province of Panama as U.S.-funded camps, and then they're headed right for the United States. Tens of thousands of Chinese this year alone pouring through the Darien Gap. Most are military-aged men, by the way. Many are sick with tuberculosis, among other things, and they're shuttled right to the U.S. border. Here's video that investigative war correspondent Michael Yan shot just the other day of buses filled with migrants, many of them coughing uncontrollably with TB. He calls them tubercubuses. Uh, these buses are headed to America. It's a disaster unfolding right before our eyes. Michael Yan is in Panama. He's been out in the jungle uh, for a number of days. He managed to get to a hotel room. He's a Green Beret. He's been on the front lines of some of the most important stories of our time. He's a national treasure, really, to journalism. And he's really the only one that's been exposing what's been happening at the Darien Gap in Panama. And I want to welcome Michael to Redacted. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. It's a great honor to come on, Clayton. I'm I'm out of uh, the gap again. Uh, you know, I've spent months down there over the last several years, many months, four or five months in the gap and uh, the Darien Gap. And actually, at the current, the instantaneous rate of, of bus flow from Darien Gap is about 30 to 40 bus loads per day. That's increasing. But there are hundreds that are coming through when you start adding up, for instance, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Mexico. For instance, we have many of the of the migrants who are flying to places like Cancun first. So they'll fly to Cancun or Tapachula in Mexico or Mexico City, and then they will jump on their buses from there or even trains actually on the roof of some trains. So anyway, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, on the Mexican border with Arizona and the United States and also over in Morocco, watching the same thing between Greece and Turkey, Lithuania. I watch it all over Europe. Uh, and so the weaponized migration is something I study in great detail. And this hop that causes it, hop is the human osmotic pressure, the push and pull of migration. But right now we have about um, about 200 per day Chinese coming through the Darien Gap alone. That does not include ones who are coming through Bahamas, uh, the ones who are coming through, uh, for instance, um, well, Canada is a, a lot. Others are just getting uh, visas and landing at the Atlanta airport, right? So there's a lot that are coming through uh, the northern route. They fly, to, like I said, Mexico first and that sort of thing. There's many different routes to get people into the United States. But the bottom line is this is a weaponized migration. It's really unbelievable. I think to most people who are not seeing this in the Western media at all, it's been totally silenced. You've been texting me over the past few days some pretty shocking videos um, of what's what's been happening. They're really astonishing. And it's amazing actually to watch like your Twitter feed because there's so many people you post, you're there. You're seeing it with your own eyes. You're interviewing these people. You're talking to them where they're coming from out of China and other places. They're coughing uncontrollably. You're seeing it. And yet there's still this total cognitive, like, uh, uh, I don't know, total, it's like a blackout. Like people don't want to believe what you're telling them. It is. Uh, some people... You know, a great book on this topic is called Rape of the Mind. It was published in 1956 by Joost Mirlu. And Joost Mirlu is a Dutch psychologist, and it's called Rape of the Mind. I highly suggest reading it, 1956. Anyway, when you read that, there's a good vaccination against uh, uh, brain uh, mind control techniques, right? I study this intensely, actually. I've written three books on information war. Unfortunately, they're all in Japanese, none are in English, because I've been working for years to work to wake up the Japanese and there's reasons for that. But bottom line is the information war is intense. You know, I spent years in wars and kinetic wars, firefights and all that stuff. Two years Iraq, two Afghanistan, and a lot more in other places. Thailand, I got kicked out of Hong Kong in 2020. If you web search my name, you'll see the police taking me to the airport and sending me out. I mean, I've, I've spent years doing this sort of stuff. But the highest level of warfare is not kinetics. It's not firefights and that sort of thing. It's information warfare. Uh, Rape of the Mind is a book that experts often refer to, but most people haven't heard of. Anyway, that's what this cognitive dissonance that people are suffering uh, is, 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 is only growing, right? An interesting thing, for instance, with, um, with famine. Let's go to 1932-33 Holodomor in uh, Ukraine. 
Even people who were in the famine thought that if, if only Stalin knew, he would, he would fix this. So people were writing massive amounts of letters to, to Stalin, you know, to, to, uh, to, you know, to inform him. Stalin was the one doing it. The same thing happened with Mao and his huge famine. People were writing letters to Mao thinking, if only Mao knew. Well, Mao was a student of, not really in a school classroom, but he was a student of Stalin. He was following Stalin's uh, lead. This cognitive dissonance, you can tell when we all will get into cognitive dissonance uh, at times. You know, the only cult you'll never see is the one you're in, right? Mm. I've studied cults. I've tracked cults down. When I was in special forces, some of the some of the old timers there, which would be like in their 40s at the time, they, they were, uh, you know, uh, some of those, uh, you know, at the time were saying, you know, you need to study world religions, you need to study, uh, you know, mythology and things like that. And I thought, how strange. I'm, you know, I'm a Green Beret. I'm here to do other stuff, right? And, and yet this was a different form of warfare that I was being introduced to, cognitive warfare, right? And, and so that, you know, I, over the years, I read everything that Joseph Campbell ever wrote. I read, uh, you know, what a dozen or so of his books and that sort of, I've read just stacks and stacks on this. I've gone out, I've tracked down cults in places like India. I lived with a cult in California as part of my research. And so I, I can spot cults quite readily and we're surrounded by them. And these days it's so easy to make cults. Like they're like instant cults, like instant grits, you know, it, it's, you can it, it, people that know what they're doing. It's an art form. I'm, you can tell I'm from the South. You know, right. <laughs> I'm thinking about grits all the time. But uh, but uh, well, there, ahead, no, sorry. I was going to say. I mean, and that's the problem, right? This cognitive dissonance that surrounds what you're seeing there. No, there, there's not an invasion of the United States. There, there's not tens of thousands of Chinese and other immigrants pouring across the borders, coming through the Darien Gap. So, for our audience right now, who's sitting there saying, shaking their head, saying, "This can't be true. This can't be true." Can you paint a picture? What is happening? in Panama, where you are, because you've even posted this morning, you posted a, a tweet this morning, and I'm going to read it here. You said, good morning. While you slept, the occupation government, United States, was assembling its replacement army to kill you. These useful idiots will be disposed of later. Now comes your turn to experience genocide. And you posted that from uh, the Darien Gap. And in this video you post, you see these buses leaving these camps, leaving this camp, heading for the border. So what is happening there where you are right now? It's a clear, the reason I'm in Panama is the same reason I go to Netherlands, right? And I, I, any place that I go on the map, you should probably be watching, like Texas is next, right? And, uh, or Japan, I was just in Japan again, right? Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I've written three books that are only in Japanese on information warfare, right? Strictly targeting Japanese to try to wake them up with some success. And But there, a lot of Japanese are in cognitive dissonance as well. So what's going on here? This is a clear weaponized migration. It's an old strategy in warfare. Uh, for instance, uh, Stalin did it, right? Let's talk about Holodomor again. The, the, uh, the, the famine in Ukraine in the 30s, there was more than one famine there. This was actually a series of events. But, you know, he he uh, weaponized the term Kulak, like the term, you know, Jew has been weaponized or Polish or whatever. He, so first you weaponize that label, right? And you, you make people hate that label. And then you hang that label on people, right? Like Kulak, right? So it's the Kulaks, the, the rich farmers who are causing you to pay these high prices. They're the reason your children are cold in the winter. They're the reason why you're coughing and dying and that sort of thing. So you blame the label Kulak and then you hang the label Kulak on the people that you wish to destroy, like the Dutch farmers now. There's a reason I spend so much time in Netherlands. I was just there for the election in March. And the, the Kulaks uh, in, in Ukraine, not just Ukraine, but other parts of Soviet Union, uh, they, they were farmers and they needed to be wiped out to complete the big Soviet dream, right? And so what Stalin did was said, just kill them, take their land. It's like a, a crime holiday. Go ahead and take their land, which people did. So it was basically like hanging the, 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 the Star of David on Jews or the pee on Polish people. Kill them, take their land, right? Mao did the same thing. Pol Pot did the same thing. It's an old strategy. It's been done through space. We weaponization of migration. You know, I spent about a year running around China up in places like Tibet, you know, uh, oh, just all over the place. And you see mainland China, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is doing the same to Tibetans, right? They're never going to get Tibet back. 
you know, I'm up with the Tibetans in northern India and Nepal and Hong Kong. They're not getting Tibet back. Same in Xinjiang, with, in China with the Uyghurs. Same with the Falun Gong. Same with uh, the Mongolians that they've done this to. to. They've done a soft uh, genocide against the Hong Kongers, you know, the Cantonese-speaking Hong Kongers. Uh, my last seven months in, in Hong Kong was quite eventful. That was 2019 and 20 when they were when CCP was really making that final go. But what people didn't see was for years, the Chinese Communist Party had been pushing about 100 to 150 migrants, Mandarin speaking, mainlander, Han Chinese migrants into Hong Kong per day. So about 100 to 150 per day. We're moving in and slowly they took over the schools, they took over the bureaucracies, they took over the, the government, and they started just taking the elections. And now Hong Kong is part of the Chinese Communist Party uh, backyard. And Taiwan is next. That's why I was just on Ishigaki Island in, uh, in Okinawa Prefecture, which is near actually Taiwan, because I, I can clearly see that Ishigaki is going to be targeted. And anyway, we can save that for some later time. But the weaponized migration is is an old strategy, it's very common. Why Netherlands, for instance? Netherlands is key, it will affect you. We're, it'll affect everybody in Europe in a big way. Netherlands, why are they taking the farms in Netherlands? Why do I have this red handkerchief that comes from Dutch farmers? Netherlands is at the terminus of the railhead that goes all the way from Shanghai and Chengdu and all these other places in China, goes all the way across Asia, right across Germany and to Rotterdam Harbor. Rotterdam is the biggest port in Europe. And the second biggest port is Antwerp, which is just south of Rotterdam Harbor, right? So these two ports are the two biggest ports in Europe, and they are in, they are in the middle of something called Tri-State City. Tri-State City. Tri-State City is three-state city. Most of Netherlands, part of Belgium, and part of Germany is described by the map. They've already drawn of Tri-State City. Now, when I say this, World Economic Forum people will say, oh, that's a, that's a conspiracy theory. It's like, no, it's not. You've already written the book. I've got the book. You know what I mean? Right. You've got, the, uh, you know, you've got the, the maps. So the farmers in Netherlands own 60 to 70% of the land. They need that farmland for various reasons. Same reason, first of all, the farmers and the fishermen in Netherlands, well, just like in, in all over the world, they tend, to be, they tend to be patriotic to that land. Like the Dutch farmers, their families have, have had that land for centuries, right? So they are core Dutch. In Netherlands now, the Dutch government doesn't even, does not even allow uh, a, a Dutch uh, government members to use the word Holland anymore. They're not even allowed to use the word Holland anymore. And, you know, and part of the cognitive warfare, the information war, they're, they're just wiping out their culture and invading Europe, including Netherlands, of course, with all these migrants, the weaponized migration, they're they're forming Tri-State City. They need that farmland. And that's, again, Tri-State City will include the two biggest harbors in Europe. Almost no Europeans, even Dutch people don't seem to know this. And I spend a lot of time with them. I was just there for the election in March. On March 15th, as you know, they just had a big election, provincial elections in, in, uh, in, in Netherlands. And the BBB party just won in a landslide. It's called the Borden Burger Beweging. I'm sorry, I don't speak Dutch. I speak German. It's kind of similar. Borden Burger Beweging, if I said it correctly, it means uh, Farmer Citizens Movement, right? And Farmer Citizens Movement, BBB. As I'm driving around Netherlands, as I often do, I'm looking at all these political signs everywhere, the BBB, and it's BB better, right? Build back better. And I'm telling the Dutch farmers, look, Build Back Better is not even a wolf in sheep's clothing. That is a wolf in wolf's clothing. It's clearly saying, I'm going to get you. And you're in, and all these Dutch farmers are getting behind it. I was at their protest and whatnot. And I'm like, this is a wolf. <laughs> it's not even right. dressed as a sheep. Right. And they're like, no, no, they're going to represent us and this sort of thing. Well, anyway, they just won 15 seats. They just won in the landslide. And so that was March 15th. And already the BBB party, they do it right in your face. This is one of the one of the one of the very interesting aspects of cognitive war uh, of this information warfare is that the enemy, the the beast I call it, will often just tell you exactly who it is. Like I'm a wolf, and I'm coming to eat you. Well, then who is but, you know? You should like me. So that <laughs> is the that is the question. Then who is funding? Well, you know, back to Panama. You know, when we look at these buses, so these buses that are filled with people you've been interviewing that are coughing uncontrollably, they 
arguably have tuberculosis. You've been handing out medicine to some of these people who've been itching with scabies and lice and all sorts of issues. And they're coming then to the United States border and coming into the United States. We see these buses. I, 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 I got to ask you, I mean, these are like state of the art buses, right? Brand new buses. Who's funding this? Who's funding these buses that are coming into the United States with this controlled, uh, weaponized migration program? United States, uh, you know, the, for instance, uh, Mayorkas, Alexander, you know, the, uh, Mayorkas, the, 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 the chief of Homeland, of, uh, Homeland Security, he just came down to that camp where those buses are coming out of. That's called San Vicente camp, right? We are openly funding it. It's not hidden. Our flag is on tents inside that camp and also at Las Blancas camp and also in Bajo Chiquito village and Canaan Membrillo village. These actually five major camps. There's another one up near, uh, David near, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, the United States is openly funding it, as is the European Union. Now, this is a very interesting question. Who's actually doing this and why? Clearly, the World Economic Forum, they're very open about it. It's right on their website, like Governor Greg Abbott from Texas. He's part of the World Economic Forum. People don't believe me. I say, hey, stop, drop, roll. Web search, Greg Abbott, World Economic Forum. You'll see him on their website. There's his mug with his bio mm -hmm. on the World Economic Forum. None of this is hidden. It's right in your face, right? And so, it, it, and and uh, so, World Economic Forum and the, the Chinese Communist Party are co-sanguinated at this time. They're more than married, right? And they're having children. They have short-term and intermediate-term goals, which really overlap quite a lot on the Venn diagram. However, at the end of the day, they're clearly going to fight. The Chinese Communist Party—they're the most. You know, I've spent more than half of my life in about ninety countries outside of the United States. I'm usually outside of the United States. Right. I'm all over Asia, what, 18 or 19 years across Asia, another, I don't know, five years in Middle East, another six, seven years in Europe. I'm all over the place all the time. Right. So I see a lot of things. And I when I'm in China, I've never seen so much racism in my life. That's why Hong Kongers will call the Han Chinese Chai Nazis. And I'm going somewhere with this. What's it? What's a Nazi? A Nazi is fascism is when government and, and, and business is, you know, industry is just is so entwined that they're inseparable. It's like salt water. You can't, you know, what's the difference between seawater, salt and sea and all the other stuff in there? It's, 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 it's all mixed, right? That's fascism. When they're inseparable, like the FDA is clearly part of pharma or is it pharma is part of FDA? You know, they're, they're, they're inseparable, right? And now that's fascism. Nazism is just take fascism and add on, you know, about a meter of topsoil of racism, right? Right. That is Nazism, right? So that's why the Hong Kongers, the Cantonese speaking Hong Kongers, they have a completely different culture. I can tell them apart, by the way. I've spent so much time in, in Asia. I can tell Hong Kongers and I can tell them apart from mainland Chinese. They, they look different from me. Their body language is different. They act differently. Plus, they speak Cantonese instead of Mandarin, right? They speak completely different languages. So the, 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 that's why the, the, the Chinese uh, Communist Party wishes to wipe out or at least absorb all of these Cantonese speakers. For instance, now you see in, um, in Hong Kong, the Confucius Institute there at the University of Hong Kong, I was there when the students took over the university, it was epic. You can see some of the, you know, the, the, the uh, videos online with thousands of Molotovs being thrown and that sort of thing, it was unbelievable. So I was there in the, in the Confucius Institute there, I've been in the Confucius Institute down the road from me here, in, 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 uh, in Panama City, right? Confucius Institute, I've been fighting them for years. These are, this, the Confucius Institute is a, is a spy recruitment tool that Chinese Communist Party uses. And it, it get, it, they, they, they uh, install classrooms and play uh, all these big universities throughout the United States, huge universities, all the top ones, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, here in Panama City. And what they do is they recruit the children of the elite they do the same in Hong Kong and they get them over to China. They'll give them scholarships and they get them, for instance, the Hong Kongers. They say, you can't speak Cantonese anymore. Cantonese is a dying language. It's a primitive language for primitive people. That's what they brainwash them to turn against their own culture. Right. So that's what's happening with the Chinese Communist Party and their Confucius Institutes. They use the mousetrap. Mice. Mice means that's a counterintelligence term. Money, ideology, coercion ego right they use these they use these techniques that you know the, the four main uh cheeses for the mousetrap are money ideology coercion and ego so they get these young students over to china 
studying these things, and then they go back to their own countries, whether it's Germany or Netherlands or wherever, and they become big members of government and bureaucracy. Where am I going to with this? Chinese Communist Party and World Economic Forum have intermediate goals that coincide. They overlap greatly on the Venn diagram. For instance, destabilize the United States, destabilize Japan, uh, destabilize all of Europe, right? Borders don't exist type stuff. But at the end of the day, now the World Economic Forum, they want to have this global government with a greatly decreased population, and they are going to get a greatly decreased population. That's clear, right? We don't know how much, but it's clearly coming. The food shortages and whatnot are clearly coming, right? But at the end of the day, they're go the Chinese Communist Party and the World Economic Forum will get a divorce, and it will be a bloody divorce because the Chinese Communist Party are ultra racist. They are literally, as the Hong Kongers call them, Chi Nazis. If you look on my Twitter page in that upper banner up there, it says Chi Nazis. That's a photo I took during the fighting in Hong Kong. The Chinese Communist Party wishes to make the world Han Chinese. And they actually have the numbers and technology to do it. For instance, they have weaponized the, the disease called dengue, which is uh, spread by, uh, by a mosquito, mosquito, right? right, right. And, yeah. and this mosquito. Yeah, and, and they they've actually have drones that can spread this and this sort of thing that can spread the mosquitoes and that sort of thing, right? And uh, actually, if you call me on my phone, my ringer is that species of mosquito. It's called Aedes aegypti, right? Because um, dengue is there, there's a massive dengue outbreak here. And off of these mosquitoes spread malaria. There's massive malarial outbreaks here in Panama. And when I talk with the Embara Indians, I spend a lot of time with the Indians down there, Kuna, Embara, Wunan. They have massive uh, malaria now because of, one of the one of the uh, uh, leaders, uh, actually a mayor of 29 Embara villages, his name is Francisco Agape. He's an Embara Indian. Uh, he told me before the migration, I just had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago. He said, I, I know him well. I go out to the jungle with him all the time. But he said, before the migration, we had maybe one or two cases of malaria per year. And this is in Darien Gap, right? He said, so when somebody got uh, malaria, we all talked about it, right? He said, but now everybody's getting malaria. My wife got malaria. She was at the dinner table with me. Hmm. She was okay now, but, and they're getting, uh, you know, there's different types of malaria, just like there's different types of dengue, right? And, and some, of the, some of the types, the, the type that's really spreading down here thickly now is a really terrible type of malaria. It kills people. Also, the children are getting a lot of waterborne illnesses now. The Embra and the Kuna and the Wunan Indians, they all live on the rivers. Anyway, not to go into that, but the bottom line is, at the end of the day, who's funding all this? The United States government is clearly funding it. Uh, you know, uh, Mayorkas came down here with the Southcom commander, uh, commanding general in April. In fact, weirdly, she just sent me a message this morning. The Southcom commanding general sent me a message some hours ago, right? Uh, they see what's happening down here. And I don't know what the nature is of the communication, but I responded. So, but the bottom line is, is our military is also involved in helping people get through, right? They're clearly involved, deeply involved. And the United States government, I call it the occupation government of the United States, is the main driving force behind the, why are they going through South America, by the way? They're going, they're not, many of the migrants are, or let's say alien invaders at this point, are not going through South America. Like I said, many of them will start in Mexico or they just start in Canada, or they walk up on beaches in Florida, like a lot of the Chinese are, are going through, for instance, Bahamas. Uh, but the ones who will go through South America, there's specific reasons why people from about 140 countries go through South America. For instance, the Haitians and the Cubans don't need visas to go to Suriname. Suriname is a small country, an old Dutch colony in South America, right? So they can go to Suriname and then make their way over to Colombia and go up through the Darien Gap in Panama. And a lot of the Haitians already lived in Chile for usually about five to six years now. There's a lot of them that went there uh, five or six, seven years ago. And a lot of them are in Brazil. And then you had Venezuela collapse, of course. So right now, the, the, the Panamanian government, I had a long meeting with them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Panamanian high government official told me that 11% of the people in Panama are now new Venezuelans. I said, hold on. What? Please repeat that. What? Did you? I know. That's what I said. That's what I said. I said, stop. Hold on. I, I don't mean to be impolite. I mean, I was talking to her, actually. I said, did you, can you repeat what you just said? And she said, 11, her English is good. She said, 11% of the people in Panama 
are Venezuelans. I said, okay, hold on. I was just down in Colombia. And the Colombian, I mean, I was in Colombia last year, but this meeting was a couple of weeks ago. And I said, last year in Colombia, the streets in Colombia were filled with Venezuelans. But now Colombia is collapsing. And Colombia, so now I see a lot of Colombians come through. So I said, wait a minute. So let me repeat what you just said. 11%, 1-1% of the people in Panama are Venez new Venezuelans. And she said, yes, 11%. So I said, there you have it. I mean, it's like, a, and so, and, and it's destabilizing Panama. There's starting to be food problems here, not shortages. I hired two men about a week ago to go out and start uh, surveying the villages and whatnot on food issues. And, uh, and there's starting to be some food issues. There's still plenty of food, but the problem is the economy is going down for various reasons, right? Well, we can see global economies are going down. And nitrogenous fertilizers are in shortage. I've been writing a great deal about nitrogenous fertilizers. Mm -hmm. I've been warning about this a lot when I'm in Germany at BASF plant at Ludwigshafen. You know, I was with Jordan Peterson in the uh, Netherlands. I took him to a farm, spent a couple of days with him, briefing him up on these nitrogenous fertilizer issues and that sort of thing. This is a big deal. For instance, I was with this Dutch farmer in, in March. He's a pig farmer. He has over a thousand pigs and he's proudly telling me, uh, you know, I, I, I have this basically hermetic environment almost in which I use my my uh, pig manure to fertilize my pear trees and my Christmas trees. And I said, hold on, you know, farmers tend to be very smart and pragmatic people. I get along with farmers everywhere I go in the world, even if it's Afghanistan, I get along with Taliban farmers. But the Dutch farmer, I said to him, hold on. So uh, that is something to be proud of. However, where do you get your pig feed? And his eyes lit up within a second. He immediately thought, he goes, you're right. I get it from Brazil. And I said, you know where Brazil gets their nitrogenous fertilizers? They get it from Europe. They get it, a lot of it from Germany, right? And they are not getting it now. He said, oh, you're right. My prices are really climbing a lot, a great deal. Like every shipment, his prices are going up. That's right. I said, I was just with Mary Lou McDonald, the leader of Sinn Féin in Ireland. I was over in Ireland. And all she wants to talk about is equity and equality. She's got an IQ of about 90. She's the head of... Yeah, a lot of the Irish think that she's going to be, you know, in charge of, you know, a, a united Ireland. But you go up to Belfast, they still got over 20 miles of giant wall up there. They're not going to unite, right? And so the, um, the, uh, so, and, and so I'm with Mary Lou McDonald in this bar. I don't drink, but you know how it is in Ireland. And so the, and, and, and I wanted to talk with her about the migration. And she's like, uh, Oh, you know, we produce enough food for 25 million people, which is what all the Irish say. We have fewer than 8 million on the island and blah, 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 blah. I said, Mary Lou, stop. I don't want to talk about equity and equality anymore. This is nonsense. You're being overrun. Where do you get your inputs for all this food that you're producing? Your energy, right? Your gas, your nitrogenous fertilizers, your chemicals. It's, did you see what happened to Nord Stream, right? When I was at BASF, BASF is the biggest chemical company in the world. It's at the, the main plant, the biggest plant anyway, is at Ludwigshafen, Germany. They started making nitrogenous fertilizers there in arguably about 1915 or 14, if you get the Germans arguing, right? So anyway, they started making these nitrogenous fertilizers with the Haberbosch process, right? Haberbosch process is a process in which you take the hydrogen off the natural gas and you combine it with the nitrogen that we're breathing and you make ammonia, right? Uh, Fritz Haber was the German chemist who in 1903, I think, wrote his book on thermodynamics. Where he, he described a process in which you can, maybe 1904, I don't recall, I'm sorry. He wrote a book on thermodynamics in which he described a process of being able to take off the hydrogen and combine it with the nitrogen and make ammonia, right? And in 1913, they started uh, to build the plant at Ludwigshafen. Uh, the Bosch, Karl Bosch, also a German chemist was the one who took this industrial. And so you can also make explosives out of this, right? So the, the ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, uh, urea, and all these sorts of things. So that's when, if you look at the global population, started to explode after that, after about 1915, 16, 17, after this, this Haber-Bosch process went industrial. That's not the only reason the global population started to explode, but it is definitely one of the main reasons is the Haber-Bosch process, arguably one of the most important chemical processes in all of human history, which a lot of people don't know about. So I was in BASF twice last year, and I was talking with one of the Germans, I have this on audio, one of the German uh, plant people. I said, what happens if Nord Stream goes offline? This is before Nord Stream got blown up, right? I said, what happens if, because I knew Nord Stream 1 feeds BASF. 
I said, what happens if Nord Stream just magically goes offline? Because I'm thinking somebody's going to hit Nord Stream, you know? Right. And, uh, and boom, it got hit. Nord Stream 1 and 2 are these arteries, right? Yeah. Now, of the 29 major plants that make nitrogenous fertilizers around Europe, not just because of Nord Stream, but for other reasons, most are either closed or their, their, their production is severely reduced. For instance, um, now the well, well sorry where's what did he say the what did he say what did he what was his answer oh he said that's oh oh he, he answered i've got this one. i'll have to send you the audio clip he said something like in that german way he said something like then basf is dead or something like that he said it in that really german definitive way he said something like then we are dead at basf something like that so this so is all that's, an that's not verbatim but that's what he said and this is all an orchestrated plan of course right you to get oh clearly the human osmotic pressure right yeah get rid of the you nitrogenous pressure, get rid of this fertilizer cool. get rid of take take the land from these people and take control of it that's all part of the process and the world economic forum is very open about this are they not oh they're very clear in fact i arranged a couple of dinners with jordan peterson in the netherlands one is with the retired uh, uh ceo of a um of the biggest Dutch chemical plant, which is sort of like BASF in, of Netherlands. And I said, sir, can you please, I'll just be quiet and please tell uh, Dr. Peterson the things that you've told me about the, the nitrogenous fertilizer supplies and how this affects world food supplies. And so I was just like, sat there and was quiet as they talked for a couple of hours. And, you know, and he started telling Dr. Peterson uh, about where's Brazil going to get their fertilizer. They're not getting it from the Middle East. They're not going to get it from Russia. They're not going to get it from Trinidad and Tobago, India. Where are they going to get theirs from? After all this and Ireland and whatnot, I flew over to Thailand, right? And so I was meeting with an ex-prime minister there. He's a friend of mine, Abhisit. And I have an office in Thailand. I said to, and I said that his, his nickname is Mark. I said, we're having coffee. And I said, listen, I know how much fertilizer, I know how much rice and whatnot Thailand exports. You're a massive food exporter. But I really think that Thailand could go into food shortage in the upcoming years based on nitrogenous fertilizer issues. And he goes, oh, Michael, you know how much, you know, rice we export and blah, blah, blah. I said, I know you do. And let me tell you what, I've reconned the entire rice from India through Bangladesh, through Myanmar. I, I know what's going to happen when they have food problems. That human osmotic pressure is going to drive huge population into Thailand and your rice production is basically nitrogen exports, right? You produce 8% of the nitrogenous fertilizers that you need. You import 92% of your nitrogenous fertilizers. You will not be a major rice exporter when you don't have that supply. He's like, we'll get it from China. I'm like, no, you won't. You know, I didn't invite you to coffee without having my facts straight, right? You will not get it from China. You will not get it from Russia. You will not have enough fertilizer, period. You need to prepare Thailand for potential food shortages in the upcoming years. You still have time. King Rama the Ninth, great man. He was, he was the, he's unfortunately gone now. His son is the king now. Uh, king Rama the Ninth saw a protein shortage coming in Thailand in the 1960s. He saw it coming. Some people can see famine coming. You'll see, I was just over in Japan studying some people from the 1700s and the 1800s. Who, who saw famine coming and prepared people in their areas for famine and nobody died in their areas. But famine is endemic to, to Japan. Like Japan just has so many famines, you wouldn't believe it. Not in the last few generations, but it's coming again, trust me. And the, 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 uh, when in, in Thailand in the 1960s, I'm going somewhere with Japan and Thailand here, they started to have a protein shortage. And King Rama, the ninth great man, he saw it coming. He's one of those guys that could see it coming. He assembled his team. He's like, we got protein problems. What are we going to do about this? And then, you know, let's call the Japanese. So they called uh, his friend, King, uh, I mean, uh, Crown Prince Akihito. And Crown Prince Akihito said, oh, we use um, fish ponds. So he said, I'll send you some now, uh, 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 as they call them in Thailand, which is pranil, which is now perch, right? So if you go to Thailand and you look on the menus, you'll see pranil all over the place, right? So, uh, you know, in the 1700s and the 1800s in Japan, for instance, Kenjiro is one of the people that did this in Japan. He had people making fish ponds and growing ginger around the fish ponds and that sort of thing, and just stocking the fish ponds. 
And 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 so Thailand, King Rama the Ninth did this. He bred a bunch of these fish that the Crown Prince sent him from Japan. That if you go to Thailand now, it looks like the moon with all the fish pond graders. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so they so they have a lot of resilience because they did. There was you never heard about the famine in Thailand in the 1960s because it never happened. It never happened because King Rama the Ninth saw it coming. He reached out to the Japanese. He reached out to Americans, and we fixed it in advance. But now I'm not seeing that with the, the population in Thailand at that time was more about 50, 50 to 60 million. Now it's, it's, it's far higher. And they are anyway, long story short, same with Japan. Japan imports 80 to 90 percent of its food and energy. Japan can instantly go into famine if they're blocked at sea. Fam, uh, uh, Japan is absolutely vulnerable to famine. And a lot, most of the Japanese don't see it. That's why I've been writing these books in Japanese, waking up because I love Japan. And, you know, I highly respect the Japanese people, but they're like Americans. They're just walking around being Japanese all day and not realizing the big, big bad wolf is at the door. Right. Hmm. And, and he will cut them off at sea. And so we now have the situation where it seems like the Biden administration is, well, actively, actively, of course, encouraging this invasion of the United States, doing nothing to stop it. The U.S. State Department, in fact, went down the, the U.S. State Department, which in my, to my mind is one of the strongest propaganda government offices in the United States. I've I've seen their private documents. Uh, it's unbelievable. Um, they say that everything is under control at the Darien Gap. They've been sending millions of dollars, U.S. dollars, to make sure that everything is safe and orderly. The migration is happening there at Camp Darien. So basically, there's no problem. That's what they're saying, right? That's what Mayorkas is saying. That's what the Biden administration is saying, that there's no problems, Michael. There's no problems. This is all, this is, you're, this is a, this is, this is some sort of right-wing uh, propaganda, right-wing conspiracy talk. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetop. You know, on my Twitter this morning, I got an advertisement for marijuana, right? You know, I see people like Joe Rogan, uh, you know, smoking dope right in front of millions of people. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetop. Let's drink some whiskey. You know, I don't drink whiskey. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke marijuana. I drink coffee. We don't have time for this. This is very serious. This is truly life and death. We are truly in a state of war, right? And all this, you know, oh, nothing's going on. We've got everything under control. Rock a bye, baby. Right? That's what's happening right now. As the big bad wolf gathers and the storm gathers, we see what's happening. The United States is clearly in a state of low level civil war at this point already. I feel like an oncologist who's been doing this for decades around the world, and, and I can just walk into the room and smell the cancer, right? I mean, I do this in country after country after country, Hong Kong, Thailand, Nepal, Philippines, Iraq, Afghanistan, long list, right? War is what I do, right? And so, you know, I warned Japanese, for instance, for years about this comfort women information war, for instance. And it's a long story about this World War II comfort women stuff. And so I warned them that this is being, and I warned Koreans. I've spent a lot of time in Korea warning them. This information campaign is being used to split relations between Korea and Japan so that CC, Korea, Japan, and the United States, a very important defense triangle, so that divide and conquer, right? So finally in 2019 and 2020, this World War II information campaign about comfort women, you know, kidnapping sex slaves from World War II stuff, finally went through the court process and is making a hard split between Japan and Korea. They don't even share intelligence anymore. They don't do naval exercises together anymore, right? I was actually just with a three-star general over in Japan and some of their intelligence people talking about these sorts of things. They are dividing us and conquering. Japan and Korea need to be as one, right? This is so important. And yet this information war is just causing them to fight each other. You see these comfort women statues like in Glendale, California, which I've gone to see in and other in Los Angeles, a long, long list, right? Long story on all this sort of stuff. But again, it's rock a bye baby while the information warfare just piles up deeper and deeper. I could go on for days on this, Clayton. Uh, so you'll have to press stop. Otherwise, I will fill up all the space. <laughs> Well, no, I want to hear, you know, and we could talk, I could talk for, I could talk for hours on this. And, uh, you know, I think the impetus for me talking with you, of course, is what's been happening in Panama and the flood of these migrants coming up towards the U.S. border and then, of course, pouring across the border down there. Uh, 
But it's a much bigger story than that. It's not just the Darien Gap, as you're pointing huge. out. It's huge, right? It's the World Economic Forum. It's, it's the, global. It's the total control. It's the total control. And even when you just mentioned whiskey, my mind went to, that's why this thing is so much bigger than the Darien Gap. My mind went to the story out of Japan three months ago where the, the government was pushing the use of whiskey again. They really wanted their population to be drinking more whiskey because it's the sedation process, right? It's the it's the mind control. If you have a population that comes home every day and doesn't cause trouble and just drinks, smokes pot, then you're fine. Then you can go about manipulating them and taking total control of them by doing this. And so the, the Japanese government coming out and pushing, trying to encourage people to to start drinking whiskey again and, and start to drink uh, great Japanese whiskeys. Like what? When is the government promoting that their population should be uh, sedated on a regular basis. But once you start to peel that layer back, you start to think about why that is, then it makes perfect sense. But on the surface, it sounds absurd, right? Soma. You've heard the old drug Soma from the old opium wars. Right. I mean, it's an old tactic. Rock and buy, baby. Have some fire water. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Here. You know, so, so we've got fentanyl and these sorts of things just flowing. Oregon right now. Uh, I know that I know the biggest legal marijuana farmer in in Oregon. I was in the White House with him of all places. It was just, uh, his name's Dave Parnell. And uh, maybe Dave will watch this. I'll send him a link. So we met actually in Washington and we had quite a few dinners together and lunches. And, and then we're in the White House together. I said, so wait a minute, Dave, let's get this straight. You're the biggest marijuana farmer in Oregon and we're in the White House together and you cannot have a bank account because it's, this is illegal federally, right? right. And it, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of weird, isn't it? I said, that's very weird. And so he invited me to his farm. So I flew out to Oregon and I looked at his farm. He's got that great soil that you see in places like, you know, Ukraine, you know, right. I mean, it's like, or actually in Darien Gap, that soil. I was looking at soil down here last week. It's unbelievable. And, uh, and, and I said, this is some of the best soil in the United States that's being used to grow marijuana. And, and yeah, and he said, in fact, um, now his neighbors are, are cartel people. In fact, he messaged me uh, last winter. He's like, hey, they're greenhouse. I can see it. It collapsed under snow. They, don't, they haven't figured out that you have to clean the snow off yet. They're, they're new to greenhouses. You know, and we have Chinese communists over in Oklahoma running huge drug operations in Southern California as well. This is all part of a larger, very comprehensive plan. And it's so comprehensive. Again, the only cult you'll never see is the cult you're in. When you really start to look at information more, on a on a large scale right you start to realize this is like the dairy and gap jungle there's a it's a multiplayer game there's a lot of people that sometimes they're in competition with each other other times for instance the world economic forum and the chinese communist party they have short-term and medium-term goals that coincide so they're reinforcing in fact you know the annual meetings in uh davos or in switzerland or in, or in davos switzerland right for the world economic forum but there's also annual meetings in china right mm. So there's annual meetings in China. Actually, a good person for you to talk with would be Masako Ganaha, the Japanese journalist who tracked down Klaus Schwab, uh, and she was the one that was tracking him down a few months yeah, ago in Davos. Snow. Yeah, she's yeah. she that, that was that was Masako. I communicate with her every day. I've had her down in the dairy and gap. She's unbelievable. I call her Samurai Masako, and 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 she's uh she's been with us in Colombia. You wouldn't believe it. She everywhere. And she, she uh, understand she was just on some of the big media in the United States talking about the U S ambassador to Japan, pushing the woke narrative in Japan, the LGBT stuff or whatever it is, you know, pushing that around Japan. Like when I'm in, J I'm in Japan, you know, quite, again, I've written three books that are, I wrote them in English, but they're only in Japanese. And, and so I spent a lot of time there trying to wake up the Japanese. And I see BLM protests in Japan. You can't believe this stuff. Like when I'm on Ishigaki Island, I was just down in Ishigaki with, with Masako and Chuck Holton, and we were meeting with the mayor there. And the, and the mayor of Ishigaki Island, which is close to, to uh, Taiwan, he's very worried. He's like, you know, it's near Senkaku, actually, that island chain as well. And there's a lot of energy issues out there. And what, he, he's very worried. He goes, you know, we have 60,000 people on Ishigaki. We import about 87% of our food. And, uh, and, and we grow mostly sugar cane, which I can see as we're driving down the road. This is big sugar cane. You can't feed everybody on sugar cane. And, you know, and, uh, and he goes, what we're worried about is when, the, when it kicks off with Taiwan, all these fishing boats from Taiwan 
filled with Taiwanese, which, you know, the Japanese and the Taiwanese, they get along very well with each other. I mean, they're probably making babies right now. Taiwanese and Japanese are like best buddies, right? But there's also a lot of mainland Chinese in Taiwan, right? And what they're, what they're worried about is Ishigaki Island, which would sort of be like the Florida Keys uh, for Florida. It's a stepping stone. It's part of Okinawa Prefecture, right? So once you're, once you're on Ishigaki, and the, the mayor's like, we're gonna, all of my people are going to have to leave. We're not going to have enough food. And then all of the homes for all of my people in Ishigaki, it's going to belong to spies and whatnot who come in because we know it's not going to be just Taiwanese who come in. It's going to be mainlander spies landing in those fishing boats. And, you know, they're not really going to be fishing boats. You know, the, the Chinese Navy, the PLA Navy, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they operate and they don't go in uniform, right? They, 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 they famously, one of their most famous tactics is to go out of uniform. By the way, Geneva Conventions, the reason, you know, when I was in Special Forces, we were talking about, you know, you can go out of uniform if, if you want, but if you get caught out of uniform, you can be shot on the spot as a spy. And the reason for this, there's a specific reason for this. When the military goes out of uniform, then the opposing armies can't tell who the enemy is. So then they do genocide. They start doing mass murders. They're like, well, just kill them all, right? So if we can't tell them apart, kill them all, right? That's what happened in Nanjing, right? In the, in the late 30s, right? So the Chinese, were they were fighting each other. The nationalists and the communists were fighting each other. And then the Japanese, you know, jumped into the mix. And the next thing you know, you know, the Chinese are out of uniform. And the Japanese were like, kill them all, right? And, uh, and, and, and it was, you know, Chinese were killing Chinese, Japanese. Were, you know, bottom line is that's why you have to wear uniforms, right? There's three main... Uh, uh, Chinese intelligence organizations we have to be concerned about. One is called PS, public security. Public security is like their FBI. FBI, the public security are the ones who open the, the police stations, for instance, in Dublin. I was just at that police station with Masako in Dublin. Uh, they opened one in London. We were at that one as well. They have one in New York. As you know, some people, some Chinese were just arrested there. Was that two or three weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, we covered, it. we covered it That's here on the show. Yeah, yeah. That, that's public security, right? So that's one aspect. That's like their FBI. They, as you know, they enforce Chinese law overseas. They've kidnapped people out of Thailand and openly did it, by the way. Not this is conspiracy. They, they did it. They took them to China. So that's number one. Number two is MSF, Ministry of State Security. Ministry of State Security is like the CIA, right? So Ministry of State Security is number two. Number three is the GS of the PLA. That's the General Staff of the People's Liberation Army. General Staff of the people. They have a language school at Luyang, China, right? And at this language school, that's where they teach people how to be spies. They teach them how to speak Portuguese. They teach them how to speak German and Italian and French and English, right? And they, if you're learning a foreign language, uh, at, if a language is very different from your own, say Mandarin to German or Mandarin to English, or English to Mandarin, it's very, very difficult to learn it without an accent if you learn it after puberty, right? You need to learn it before puberty. Otherwise, it's, I mean, you can learn, say, Portuguese to Spanish and get rid of some of the accent or disguise the accent in different ways. But it's very difficult to go from Mandarin to English, right? So another way, I went to a language school in the military as well, the Defense Language Institute, but there we weren't learning to be spies. I was just learning to speak German, right? And so, so I, that's where I learned to speak German, right? And so, uh, but their language school at Luyang, this is where they teach you how to be spies. That's the GS school. That's the general staff school. And there they have American teachers, Canadian teachers. They have native speakers. And you're, it's an immersion where like this one guy that I just interviewed a few weeks ago down in, in Darien Gap. Uh, we've got a lot of information on him now. He had a very good English accent. I can tell he's clearly not Native American, not born in the United States. But it's actually, it sounds like he's been there most of his life. I can tell he learned it after puberty because I just know these things, right? But you can tell he went to the special language school. They call it the official accent, actually. That's what Chinese intelligence will call this. They call it the official accent. He had the official accent. And it's a, it's a school where you're, you know, you're watching Gilligan's Island. You're watching baseball, football. You're watching all American television programs. You have American teachers. You have Chinese. You have uh, uh, Canadian teachers and whatnot. You really know a lot. You know exactly when to say things like, hey, bro, blah, blah, blah. You know, when to, when to throw these spices in, right? And he, he was that guy. Right now, as far as I know, he's in Mexico. Uh, in, and uh, anyway, very interesting guy. I interviewed him for an hour and a half. 
To me, he's an obvious GSPLA guy. Now, I don't have proof of that, but my intuition, my, I sent the audios and videos of our, of, our, uh, of our interview to quite a few intelligence people, and every one of them is like, spy, you know? Wow. I'm like, some of these guys are kind of obvious. Some of these guys are kind of obvious. And a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, you can't tell a spy. I'm like, you don't know anything about spies. This guy was itching. He was, he'd just come out of the Darien Gap. It was at nighttime. We intercepted him on Highway 1, walking up the road at nighttime. He was tired. He was hungry. He'd just come out of several days in the Darien Gap. He was itching. He either had scabies or something. It could have been modern guys, this bug out in that part of the jungle. It's, they're terrible. And he was just scratching and, and he was in an emotional state and it's nighttime and he was alone. This is the best time to interview people is at nighttime when they're alone, especially when they're not in their comfortable place. Like he's in a place that he doesn't even know where he's at. Right. And he was spilling. He was talking a lot. He said that he was just over in Bahamas and he bought. If you take notes of what I'm telling you, this is highly checkable. I've already checked some of it out. It's true. He said he was in the Bahamas. He said he bought a boat from a Scotsman for $5,000. I have not been able to uh, verify that. He said that he was on his way to Florida. And this would be March 8th. He was on his way to Florida. He ran out of gas, right? And he got picked up by the U.S. Coast Guard. This is confirmed. He did get picked up by the U.S. Coast Guard on March 8th. That's confirmed, right? That's now confirmed as of yesterday, right? They sent him, the U.S. Coast Guard sent him back to uh bahamas where bahamas was deporting him to china they flew him through cuba that was where his connection flight was and there he changed his flight he flew to quito ecuador which is where most of the chinese go who are coming through the Darien gap they go to quito and then they can land in quito take a bus to a place called nicocli in colombia i've done this you go to nicocli you get on a boat and you go to copargana colombia i've done this i've been on that boat from copargana you go through the Darien gap and that's where I intercepted him right when he came out of the Darien Gap. And he said, that's what I just did. And, you know, I got his phone number and he's, he's up and he, uh, I've checked out his phone number. It's a very interesting phone number, clearly listed in China, address, the whole works, right? And uh, it's, it's a strange phone number. And uh, bottom line is he's in Mexico or he, he, he has not crossed into the United States through any legal means at this time. But I haven't heard from him in several days. So is he in the United States yet? I don't know. But is this guy PLA? Is this guy a general staffer? He really comes across to me like he's been to the Liu Yang school. His accent was very good. He, he knew a lot about American culture. He knew when to throw in the bro and all this stuff. He knew something about our law. He knew, one, one of the things that these guys will do is they'll say, oh, I'm crazy and things like that. What they're doing is they're setting up a legal defense later because there are CCP lawyers in the United States where when people like me, publish things like this, they'll sue us. Like I may be sued, for instance, for saying this, right? I haven't said the guy's name, so that'll be, it would be a difficult lawsuit. But I mean, but the point is, is, is they will sue people like me for saying these sorts of things. This lawfare and what, this is a very deep level of warfare, right? This isn't just people coming across the border. This is highly facilitated. The snakeheads, the Chinese call them snakeheads. We call them coyotes. Coyotes are people who, you know, do coyote stuff. They shuttle people across the border. The Chinese have a very serious system of snakeheads. They, for instance, the, in Quito and up in Nicocli and up in Capargana. And then when they come through the Darien Gap, in fact, one of the snakeheads uh, about a month ago, she came out in a truck and she gave this box filled with American money to some of the migrants. And uh, the migrants left the box on the table. It's empty now, unfortunately, it has no more money in it. And, um, and I kept the box. So this is, this is the sort of stuff that's going on now. She came up in a pickup truck, handed them this out the window. They took the money out and they left the box on the table. Yeah. I mean, this sort of, wow. I see this stuff daily. Wow. Yeah. This is a very, very serious system. There's a snakehead in Tapa Chula, Mexico. There's another one in Mexico City, Cancun. You know, they, the Chinese will land in these places. And, and, and again, most of them bypass Darien Gap. And, and the prices that they're paying to get through Darien Gap, the Chinese pay more. The average price that I hear from them to get this far is 20,000 US dollars. So 20,000 US dollars to get this far, to get up into the United States will be another 10,000 for the Chinese. Other people pay a lot less, right? Like one family man told us about three weeks ago, he had paid about $60,000 to get his family 
that far so far. These are not poor people, right? Um, now the accents on some of these people, they're from all over China. On one of my recent trips, I took two Chinese with me. I took one Cantonese speaker and I took one Mandarin speaker. And the Cantonese speaker, dry hole, we, after talking with about 50 Chinese, not a single one of them spoke Cantonese. Um, some spoke, some speak Fujian, that sort of thing. Actually, I was recently on Alex Jones. He called me up and we were on the Darien Gap a few days ago and he, he saw some Chinese behind me. He said, why don't you go talk with that? You know, Alex did. Yeah. I was like, okay. So I took out this, I took out this earpiece and I, and, and the Chinese guy put it in his ear and you can see us I'm on live with Alex Jones. And, and, and I said, you know, I, yeah, he spoke some English and I said, where are you from? He said, Fujian. I said, oh, you speak Fujianese? He said, yes. You know, Fujianese is a type of Chinese. A lot of people in Taiwan speak that in a certain part of China. And a lot of them, they, they speak dialects from all over China. Some other people at a nearby table were speaking a dialect from northern China. And they were very white, actually, a lot of the people from northern. And they kind of look Mongolian, actually. Uh, there's people from all over China. I meet some that say they're from Xi'an or Shanghai or Chengdu or whatever. And again, I spent about a year running around China, so I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the terrain. And, uh, and, and, and when I record and do our, our, our interviews, I'll send those back sometimes live, actually. I'll just be like live streaming back to Chinese interpreters and they'll be like, that's a Northern Chinese dialect, right? Or, or that wow. sounds like, uh, you know, they're speaking food, they're speaking Fujianese, right? Uh, that sort of thing. And so they're from all over China, but these are not poor people. They're not, they could have stopped in Quito in Ecuador. They could have stopped anywhere they wanted along the way. They could be in Europe and they are, I mean, cause they're also going to Europe as well, as you know, and this is a weaponized migration. And again, different groups have different goals. The Chinese Communist Party, clearly, openly, they don't hide it. They, they intend to use biological warfare and other methods. Read unrestricted warfare, unrestricted warfare, read it. They intend to take over the world. You know, the idea that the Japanese could have done this in the 1930s and 40s, you know, which was sold to our grandparents, you know, the Japanese can take over the world. I'm like, what? 70 million Japanese take over the world. There's like eight of them speak English. Right. You know, the Japanese are never going to speak, never going to take over the world. It's not even their personality, right? They're, they're, they just like to be Japanese. They're like the, they're like the, uh, the Bhutan of the Pacific. You know what I mean? I love Japan, but they're not so extroverted that they're going to be able to take over the world. Right? right. And they didn't have the numbers, but the mainland Chinese can do it. They have the will to do it. They do genocide on a regular basis against, say, uh, the, the people in Tibet, the people in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, against the Falun Gong, against the Mongolians, against each other. They've done massive genocide against each other, like Mao's Great Famine. It's a great book to read, by the way. It's a blood-curdling book, Mao's Great Famine. I read a lot of books on famine and whatnot and pandemic because that's all part of war. Pan for war, pandemic, famine, war, right? The three triangles of death. Pandemic, famine, war. A couple of years ago, I was in an interview, a live interview, and a, a, one of my readers called in. She said, you talk about pandemic, famine, war, pan for war, as if you made it up. And I said, I did. She said, it's in the Bible. I said, oh, <laughs> it is in the Bible. It's the four horsemen. I'm sorry about that. That's probably where I got it from, and I didn't even give credit to the Bible. I mean, you know, it, it's a, apologies. I mean, it's clearly in the Bible, right? They knew it back then. You know, right. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and, and I thought I discovered it, but obviously I didn't. And because our, our ancestors knew it <laughs> so long ago, they go together. If you get a big pandemic, you will always get famine and war. I'm not talking right. about some little one somewhere because there, there are small famines that you have on. And one of the things that spreads in pandemic is what they call, or, or let's say famines is something called famine fevers, right? Famine fevers. One of the famine fevers is typhus, typhus. You'll see increasing outbreaks. I see them. I've been tracking typhus for years, right? Because I look at that for places where I might need to go look. Oh, there's a typhus outbreak, so and so, like Los Angeles, right? So typhus has different names famine fever, camp fever, hospital fever, ship fever, naval fever, war fever, and, and famine fever. It's one of the famine fevers. Rheumatic, uh, relapsing fevers is also one of the. But whenever you have a famine, Within a few months, you'll start to see the typhus outbreaks. What spreads epidemic typhus? There's different types of typhus. There's scrub typhus. We don't need to worry about that. There's, uh, unless you're in, say, India or Bangladesh. Uh, and then there's marine typhus spread by fleas. And then there's epidemic typhus. That's the one we need to be concerned about. Epidemic typhus is spread by lice, right? Now, in Darien Gap here, there are a lot of lice. And there, I mean, like the Imbra Indians and Kuna Indians get a lot of lice and whatnot. 
but there's not been any typhus outbreaks, right? Uh, there's cases at times, but you, you can actually, if your health department stays on it, you can knock it down. I found recently uh, something called, what's it called? The American Pediatric Society or something like that. They're actually recommending that in the United States, that if children come to school with lice, not to send them home, which is an, a clear attack. That's like Joe Rogan smoking the bomb on, on a show or something, right? That's like the worst advice. You, you know the word cooties? You know the game yeah. cooties that you're talking yeah. to your kid? Oh, no, he's got cooties. Cooties is the old English name for lice, right? It's the old English name for lice. Oh, stay away from cooties. Cooties will, you know, get you, make you sick. So cooties, typhus, and when you hear the Dutch, ask your Dutch friends and, uh, and what, what their worst cuss word is. Their F word is typhus. They'll be like, typhus. You know what I mean? I mean, wow. that's how bad typhus is. It's actually the worst Dutch cuss word. They'll be like, typhus, you know, <laughs> and uh, typhus upon you, typhus you, wow. <laughs> typhus off, you know. Wow, I've never you heard know, that it's, I mean, typhus, ty ty typhus is is one of the, if people look at this as one of the dark ages things and you know, it's, we'll never see it again. Nonsense, it's endemic to California and Texas and it's in these homeless camps already, but we keep it knocked down because when people come in with lice, we go in there and, and you know, get rid of the stuff, burn it or whatever. Uh, if the kids come to school with lice, you know, send them, you can get it cleaned up, you know, permethrin. There's things that you can do for, for, for lice and also scabies is another very serious disease. And which is clearly spreading, not to mention multi-drug resi resistant tuberculosis, which is coming up Highway 1 every day on these buses right now. It's already all over the United States. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is one of the worst pandemic, one of the worst diseases in all human history, right? It's up there with black death, yellow fever, smallpox. It's Mac Daddy, right? This is not Spanish flu. Spanish flu was bad, but Spanish flu was like an ultra cold, right? It killed tens of millions of people, maybe. But it's nothing like tuberculosis. Nobody even knows how many people have died from tuberculosis. One book that I read on it estimated a billion, right? I've read, I, I've read, I've read about five dozen books on pandemic. Uh, I've read about forty before this pandemic and twenty during the lockdown. I'm constantly because remember, pandemic, famine, war. I'm a war correspondent. I study those three things and information work constantly, right? And the tuberculosis that's coming through now, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, we can't stop it. It's already all over the United States. Even the CDC admits to this, right? And uh, what are we going to do as these busloads of people come up with? They're coming from places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, these places which are the, the MDR TB is there, right? And the doctors, who are, the doctors who are watching this, who specialize in this, know how serious this is. Mm -hmm. And there's other, other, other things coming up as well. Nobody is being screened. Mm -hmm. You know, people say in the past, well, what did they do in the old days? You know, did they, we didn't do it in the old days. Yes, we did. We, we, we put people on quarantine islands and that sort of thing in the old days. Right. Or if, if somebody comes in coughing or has a fever or something, you go to this line, right? That's not what's happening. They're just getting scratching and itching and getting on these buses. I'm like, which one of these buses is taking, you know, Ebola up, jeez, right? Jeez. Which one is taking up? You know, I read a couple of books on Ebola recently just so that I can kind of be familiar with it, right? Um, and and, and, and I, this biological warfare, some of it's just stupidity, and other parts are clear biological warfare. For instance, advising people not to send children home from school who have lies. That's the worst advice. That's like saying, ah, you know, just because you're coughing in people's faces and you just came from Afghanistan, it doesn't mean you should be sent home from school. Yes, you should. <laughs> and you should be screened for whatever the doctors think you should be screened for. I'm sorry. I'll go on forever, Clayton. And I love come. Thank you for having me. No, on. absolutely. And uh, when you know when you're here next, and when you're, I would love to have you in the studio. But I wanted to have you on and to kind of get an update on what's happening at Darien and sort of the larger picture of all of this, and help people understand that this is part of a larger process. Hopefully, this interview opens up people's minds where they start to read those books. They start to peel back the onion a little bit further. They start to question the stuff that's been thrown at them, this propaganda that's been thrown at them. So, Michael, Michael Yan, I want to thank you so much for your time, your attention your work on all of this and uh, be safe as you head up to Texas where it might even be dangerous maybe more dangerous in Texas now with the craziness that's happening there than <laughs> where you've been there uh, Michael thank you so much I for joining will, us here actually. I appreciate it I really really appreciate it thank you Clayton can I say one more thing of course please read 
rape of the mind, rape of the mind, rape of the mind, read it. That's your vaccination against being brainwashed. Anybody can be brainwashed, even me. Read rape of the mind. That's your it'll that's your vaccine. That's your vaccine. That's your that's your reading assignment homework, everyone. Read Rape of the Mind. We will. We'll have it on our rape book of the list. Mind. 1956. Before they ban it. Thank you. Read it before they ban it. Michael, great to see you. Thank you so much. Safe travels up to Texas, and uh, thank you for all your work, and we'll hope to have you here in the studio real soon. Thank you, Clayton.